Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends of the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies. The pandemic has forced us to change our habits and acquire new skills. But I am glad that COVID-19 had neither paralyzed us nor discouraged us from organizing traditional events that proved their worth in the past. Traditions and continuity, continuity in good, belong to our way of life. This is why I am very pleased that I can launch the fifth edition of our Net at Work event. I want to welcome you all, the active participants, panelists and speakers, but also all followers. Allow me to thank three Martin Centers member foundations that organize and co-sponsor the event together with us, the Martin Center. It is Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, its European office in Brussels. It is Politische Academy from Austria, and it is also Hans Seidel Stiftung. From our Martin Center side, I want to thank Anna Nalivaiko, the mastermind of the event, and also Jamil Kitone, the technical mind of our webinars and online conferences. I want separately thank those member foundations that have decided to participate actively with their particular panel discussion. Usually we, the Martin Center and other European foundations are dealing with the greatest, more or less global challenges and the hottest topical European issues. But I know very well that for every human being, the hottest issue is this one who burns him or her the most. This is the reason why we wanted to bring also regional and national challenges, emphasis or priorities to Brussels, or as it happens in these times to common virtual table. And I'm very happy that it happens. Dear friends, we have eight panels in two days. We start with Anton Tunega Foundation from Slovakia and the topic, current challenges to religious freedom. Then we continue with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and Political Academy with the title, Staying Subsidiarity, Getting Stronger. The third panel will be chaired by Konstantin Karamanlis Institute from Greece and will be devoted to digital transformation as a geopolitical challenge for Europe. And we will finish today with Hans Heidel Stiftung and Luigi Sturzo Institute from Italy and migration. More specifically, with the new European Pact on Migration. Closing remarks will be made by Markus Ferber, member of the European Parliament and the president of the Hans Seidel Stiftung. Tomorrow, we start with the opening remarks of Dr. Hardy Ostry, the head of the European Konrad Adenauer Stiftung office in Brussels, and the panel devoted to the geopolitical challenges of the Eastern Mediterranean and the EU-Turkey relation. The panel is organized by the Klavkos Clarides Institute from Cyprus. Then we continue with the Gasperi Foundation, Italy, and team a Europe that protects its heritage. After that, we will, uh, together with CDA Research Institute, and the, uh, discuss about the Green Deal. And the final panel will be devoted to the future EU enlargement and the Western, Western Balkan region. The panel, the last panel, has been prepared by the Freedom and Democracy Foundation from Albania. And the closing remarks will be made by Bettina Rausch, 
the president of the Politische Academy. Dear friends, I wish us all very, very inspiring debates. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Miriam Lexman, member of the European Parliament and the moderator of our first panel. Dear Miriam, ahoy, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Miki. Uh, thank you to the Wilfrid Martin Center for this very, very important event. And as Mikulas Durinda has said, it's absolutely vital that we continue in doing what we are trying to do is to influence and to shape EU policies that they are more successful in the more and more, ever more challenging world. So thank you to the Wilfrid Martin Center uh, for fighting against these uh, COVID restrictions to, to our work and coming with the very innovative ways of, of uh, working together. Thank you to also to uh, Anton Tunega Foundation for co-sponsoring this, uh, this part of the event. It's a great privilege for me to, to chair this, um, this panel on current challenges to religious freedoms because uh, maybe also because of my family background, my grand uncle, Father Mikulaj Lexman, was one of the first martyrs of the communist regime, where the Marxist ideology was trying to eradicate any religion and, uh, and freedom of thought of the country. Uh, so that's why, for me, it's a privilege to, to chair, this, um, chair this panel. Also, today is a very symbolic day, because we are observing the Red Wednesday, which is a day when tonight many cathedrals, many bridges and civic buildings will be lit in red to symbolize the blood of the martyrs uh, of, uh, of uh, religious uh, unfreedom or of, of uh, prosecution of, uh, of people because of their religion. So without further ado, because we are a bit late, I'm going to introduce our distinguished speakers we have among us Heiner Bielefeld, who is a philosopher, historian, and theologian, and is a professor of human rights and human rights policies at the University of Erlangen. But what is more important is that Heiner was a special rapporteur of the UN for religious freedoms for six years. We have also among us Jan Fiegel, a person, a politician from my own country, who used to be the, f the first Slovak commissioner of the European Commission. He was also a deputy president of Slovakia, and he was serving as a special envoy for freedom of religion and belief of the EU, which uh, we are going to discuss this, uh, this position among other topics in, in our panel. And last but not least, I am uh, honored to welcome Rebecca Samuels Ha who is a principal investigator for religion and economic empowerment projects at the Georgetown University and a senior fellow with the Archbridge Institute. And she's a pioneer scholar uh, to uh, study the impact of religious freedom and belief on the social and economic lives of poor women in the global south. So thank you very much uh, to all of you that you have accepted our invitation. And um, uh, and then we are really looking forward to all your thoughts and inspiring uh, ideas because this, this is a topic which is absolutely vital and uh, it touches pr practically, maybe it seems that the religious freedom is something which is uh, mainly connected with the third world, but in a global world we are uh, more and more in a, in a contact with the suffering of people because of their religion and maybe maybe some of you have heard about the last scandals that we have realized that many of products which are products being used uh, in our daily lives are actually produced by by Urguis in China and in the concentration and labor camp. Uh, we are also struck by the atrocities and death penalties for blasphemy in, in countries like um, uh, like Pakistan, but also there is more and more discussion which is related to religious freedoms in our own democratic societies where we see that some ideologies and religious freedoms are clashing. So these are all the topics we are going to discuss during today's panel. 
And my first question would go to Heiner Bielefeld, who, who used to be the rapporteur of the UN on, on religious freedom and belief. And maybe the main question is, Heiner, why do you think that um, the, religion, uh, the freedom of religion and belief is uh, indispensable amid the overreaching human rights? We know that the UN Declaration of Human Rights is very clearly defining the human, uh, human rights a whole list. But why do, we, do you believe that the special focus on the religious freedoms and belief is helping us to support uh, re uh, freedom of uh, of uh, every person and religious uh, no, freedom of every person and human rights general. Thank you very much for this uh, question, Miriam. And uh, let me start thanking also the organizers for bringing us together and mobilize our imagination, our energy, our intellectual energy, our communicative uh, efforts to uh, work on behalf of freedom of religion or belief. Indeed, it is an indispensable human right. The answer is pretty obvious. Why? I mean, the answer is obvious because human beings are complex beings. Human beings need to search for an ultimate meaning in life. Human beings can develop convictions and wish to organize their lives around those convictions. And this can become an entry point for many disputes, for conflicts, but it so much enriches human life. It's part of the human condition. So you cannot respect human dignity without respecting or without appreciating this fundamental dimension of human life that human beings can cherish, develop, hold convictions, profound convictions, existential convictions, life-shaping, identity-shaping convictions. So, I mean, without recognizing that important dimension of human life, human rights would cease to be fully humane. And that's why my message is always, you can't work for human rights without taking freedom of religion seriously. At the same time, I would also say, you can't work for freedom of religion outside of the human rights context. I mean, that's for me equally important uh, because otherwise I mean, misunderstandings can occur and one might lose the focus on uh, the fact that human, uh, that freedom of religion or belief fully follows the logic that defines the human rights approach. It's a universal right. So it's not clientelistic. It's universal. It's everyone's right to feel respect, to experience respect for their convictions. Religious, but also otherwise. Freedom of religion also includes the possibility to change and also leave religion. I mean, that it, it's really part of it. And uh, so one has to understand the broader human rights infrastructure to make sense of freedom of religion or belief. And otherwise, without freedom of religion or belief, human rights would cease to be fully humane. So my interest uh, also at a conceptual level is to keep a holistic human rights agenda within which freedom of religion or belief has an indispensable part to play. And I'm saying this also against uh, tendencies of fragmentation. I mean, specialization is necessary, but fragmentation would be problematic. And um, um, some governments uh, have a tendency to focus on freedom of religion or belief in isolation. That can lead to misunderstandings. And even worse, if they maybe pit off freedom of religion against other human rights. And we have seen ideological battlefields about the preference of freedom of religion versus freedom of expression or the other way around, or pitting off freedom of religion against gender related rights also leads to misunderstandings. It leads to losing the human rights focus of freedom of religion. Only. And I think that would be rather problematic. So I think we need a holistic approach in order to be able to respond to the suffering of countless people in the world, religious minorities, religious dissidents, people in 
various regions. Uh, you already mentioned the Uyghurs in China, but Tibetans in China, other religious minorities suffer equally. We see uh, rising human rights violations also in, in Southern Asia, Pakistan, India, but also in Southeast Asia, Vietnam. Uh, indigenous peoples being violated in their religious freedom in Brazil, for instance. Uh, and uh, even though the situation in Europe is by and large a much better one, I wouldn't deny that, still we have also serious homework to do here within the EU countries. I think so we have good reasons to mobilize all our efforts, work together for freedom of religion or belief in order to promote also human rights more broadly, in which freedom of religion or belief plays an indispensable role. Otherwise, we could not work for respect of human dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heiner. Thank you a lot. I have some follow-up questions, but because we started a bit late and Jan Figel unfortunately has to leave us in, I think, half past one, I will now give the floor to Jan and then uh, we will start a discussion in the second round. Jan, uh, a part of the functions I have already mentioned, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of asking now you as a, as a former special envoy of the EU for religion, freedom and belief, um, where do you see the strengths of the EU and weaknesses in promoting freedom of religion and belief from the point of view that you, you were acting as a special envoy? And we all know that uh, now this position is vacant already for a year, we were numerous times asking as the European Parliament, the, the European Commission, to renew this post. It has not happened despite the fact that the Commission has announced that they are going to renew this post in the summer. We also have seen, seen the, the European Commission uh, in its uh, strategy for uh, human rights and democracy support did not pay enough of attention to, to freedom of religion and belief. The Council came with another document where I believe that the, the phrasing is much better and is much stronger. But we see a kind of, uh, I would say, um, di different approach of the new Commission from the old one, which has created the post you, 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 you were functioning in. And I'm just wondering, uh, what would, we, would you use as an argument why it's absolutely vital that the EU is renewing this post and where do you see, as well the weaknesses as I said, but also the strengths of the EU to help to, in, in our fight for religious freedoms worldwide? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. And I'm really very happy to be in this special panel and during special day. That's also a reason why I have to uh, skip over to the event in Prague with our Czech friends and brothers from former Czechoslovakia. Um, I'm very glad to, to see Heiner and Rebecca around and, uh, and trust in our synergy or, or uh, mutual understanding. Uh, I would like first to, to a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, applaud or, or support what was said by Heiner uh, whose, uh, you know, professionality is uh, very, very uh, respected, or I wish it would be even more known and, and spread. Uh, I think that uh, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, as it is defined in the international law, is the, the deepest expression of human uh, personal freedom. It's a litmus test of other freedoms or rights, because if this is not respected, then freedom of opinion, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly or association surely are not uh, respected as well. It's, it's very central, right? It's in the middle of the list of the catalog and expansive, right? It's important for individuals, for communities, in private and in public. So I think, or I am convinced, better to say, that promotion of freedom of religion or belief is the civilizational issue. It's criterion and objective, both the end and the mean or, or the way how we achieve the, the ends. And of course, uh, today a lot of uh, uh, identity politics is growing and, and more and more influential. So if we don't care 
about the important component of identity, human conviction, human faith, then we are lost in, in 21st century. We are all different in identity, but we are all equal in dignity. And this great principle invites us to know, to respect, to promote, promote both sides of this important principle, of this important or crucial creative uh, equation. Situation, of course, is very worrying in the world. Most of people live in countries where obstacles or high obstacles for freedom of religion are in place. And uh, realities means intolerance, discrimination, persecution, and even genocidal killing or, or liquidation. I was nominated to the position you mentioned, Miriam, especially uh, during time of genocide in the Middle East. And either we are commentators, lamentators, observers, or real leaders of humanity in good sense of Schumann's uh, uh, request or legacy. And the European Union, as you ask uh, your point, uh, should be a leader. It doesn't mean competition. It means example. It means ex engagement. Strength of Europe and European Union uh, is that it's not seen as, as hard power, but, but as a soft power. We are not imposing, but we are proposing. When we proposed Pakistan, very good instrument for cooperation called GSP+, Plus, uh, for, for preferential treatment in trade, which is very beneficial to Pakistan's economy and troubled society, we can ask also for certain very objective criteria for human rights, for labor rights, for environmental protection, fight against corruption, justice for all. And this helped to create atmosphere where, where the new government came into power when constitutional court finally, after nine years, released Asia Bibi. And there are also some other changes coming in this country, which is just example uh, in, uh, in our debate, because Pakistan is usually ranking very high in the list, on the list of uh, different uh, reviews of the situation. So EU is seen as community of values. Of course, we are not perfect, but we do our best to, to really uh, stick to this principle. Uh, and I, I, I could witness uh, this authority this credibility, not only in Pakistan, but also in Sudan, in Iraq and other uh, countries. Therefore, we should use this positive or constructive influence. It's very important. FORP as a policy was missing in the portfolio of European Union foreign and security policy, which was a mistake. Uh, and I am glad that in 2013, Council adopted guidelines for promotion of freedom of religion or belief, which is a very important political and diplomatic tool. Uh, secondly, in Parliament, in 2000 or from 2014 on, there is an intergroup dealing with freedom of religion or belief and religious tolerance. Very important expression of not only individual, but institutional care or interest on this agenda. And since 2016, there was special envoy, first ever, dealing with these uh, issues. I had very good contacts with Heiner Bielefeld, uh, with Ahmed Shahid, with US uh, uh, ambassador at large and other uh, representatives. After my nomination in 2016 or from 2016 on, several member states started to, to, uh, to do the same or follow this line. United Kingdom, Denmark, Netherlands, Germany, Lithuania, Estonia, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic established their envoys or ambassadors. So my point to, to your question is, was this a mistake? Was this something wrong? No, it was very logical response to the situation or global crisis around four, uh, which, which we witnessed. Uh, secondly, European Parliament in 2016 February, when it adopted a very strong uh, resolution on uh, genocide in Syria and in Iraq against Christians, Yazidis, Shia Muslims, 
and other minorities with overwhelming majority uh, requested European Union to establish permanent position of special representative for promotion of freedom of religion or belief. Was it mistake of the parliament? Parliament uh, thought it uh, wrongly, incorrectly. Parliament, commission, member states. As example, to those who oppose such uh, uh, institution or such position, I must say that good example is in Geneva. There is United Nations Human Rights Council with a special uh, position of Human Rights Commissioner, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet currently. And there is also special United Nations Rapporteur on uh, freedom of religion or belief in the world, uh, currently Ahmed Shahid. Is it a conflict? Is it misunderstanding? It's a competition? No. It's complementarity, declaring and showing that the tandem and, and the mutual cooperation is important to promote human rights in general and FORP in particular. So I think that European Union should understand and, uh, and follow this line, not only for the sake of its own credibility, but also for better cohesion of different positions now, because we have envoys in many countries, uh, in majority of EU countries. When I had opportunity not only to speak, but evaluate my three and a half years with, uh, with uh, special representative for human rights, Eamon Gilmore, he was very um, explicitly supportive and willing to continue in such cooperation. So, Miriam, my answer is European Union should establish and institutionalize such policy. It is also in line with the special resolution adopted uh, last year in January when European Parliament by, I think, 576 votes supported multi-annual uh, uh, mandate of special envoy for FORP with, uh, of course, adequate resources and some competencies in order to not only build credibility of EU, but to help the persecuted communities worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, because you will have to leave in a few minutes, I will have a follow-up question for you before I will give the floor to Rebecca. And my follow-up question is related to what Jaime also mentioned and I touched upon in my introduction is the maybe growing challenges for religious freedom inside of the democratic world. Because we, you, you yourself have mentioned the identity and how important religious freedom is to our, ide uh, our identity. We are uh, witnessing also identity policies which are practically having a different maybe opinion about what supports and, and what undermines human dignity. And, and here, this kind of challenge can be translated also different understanding of, uh, of, uh, of the dignity of, of the protection of dignity and freedom of every person in practical policies related to identity, related to maybe uh, differences of view in the family or human person as such. So how do you think we should address these challenges inside of our own world? I mean, inside of the democratic part of the world. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to to your questions, but uh, that this topic was included among eight uh, these days uh, in Brussels, and maybe we need to speak more, more often, uh, more in detail, more in uh, different um, situations and con consequences. Look, difference, uh, human diversity is not a problem, it's a definition. We need to respect the other in order to be respected. There is gold, golden or silver ethical rule. This is the base of coexistence. And what we need is to live together, not only to exist together in diversity. And in order to live, which is more than to exist, we need to learn how to live in the diversity, understand religions. Most of people in the world claim religious affiliation. It cannot be a problem, it's reality. And we, 
have to know the reality in order to shape it. And um, dignity is a great term. It's, it's not something extra. It's not something like other human right or new language. It's a foundational principle. So we have rights because we have dignity. But if we claim dignity, we have also duties. Because rights without duties is a nonsense. It's a crisis. Next day. And, and this balance between rights and dignity and, uh, and, and duties is the best expression of, of real human uh, uh, dignity. The problem of uh, our Western societies, for example, because there are many challenges. In the East, it's uh, um, Islamic fundamentalism or violent extremism. It's uh, religious nationalism, for example, in India or, or Myanmar. There is totalitarian ideology. We remember it from Stalinist Czechoslovakia or Soviet camp, but it's still present in North Korea. What's going on in China is really auto authoritarian regime. But what is the problem here in Europe or in, in the West is, for example, secularism as ideology. Because fair secularity creates space for plurality, for pluralism of different sources of, of conviction. And uh, false secularity or secularism, secularism replace this freedom and plurality by indoctrination or top-down policy in our countries, in some countries. And this is against freedom. This is against identity of all or, or respect of identity of all living together, not only, not only existing together. There are tendencies now because, of course, there are violent uh, or, or terrorist uh, uh, phenomena to adopt special laws, special, because we live in special time. COVID is very special. Be, be aware that it can be really against human rights. It can be against freedom of religion or belief. For example, securitism in Russia. Uh, the, the law is called the law against extremism. And it, it focuses against Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, which is very oppressed group. It was oppressed by Stalin, by Hitler, by, by Fidel Castro and now by regime of Vladimir Putin. How come? And Putin was the mayor of Pet Petersburg when they, <clears throat> when they uh, publicly uh, admitted freedom for Jehovah's Witnesses on the territory of former Soviet Russia. Uh, some tendencies is France. In France, after attacks which were very, you know, uh, painful in Paris or Nice, uh, are at the, at the edge of uh, religious freedom or it will have some implications on religious freedom. So uh, I think we should be not only very careful but mindful uh, what we adopt as a special instruments in time of difficulties. And my last point is my father would love to have my questions or crisis of our time. He had no real freedom and brother of his, his brother Jan Fiegel was killed by secret services. So these were real tragic, bloody, bloody times in our countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Today's crisis is an invitation, as Mikloar Zurinda said at the beginning, beginning, to adapt. And we need only two basic components to get out of the crisis. Common sense and living conscience. If we do it, if we use it, correctly, we find reasonable solutions, but we also deepen our humanity. We deepen the humane character of the 21st century. And we can get out of the crisis as, as a stronger community and a stronger world. This is a role for Europe. This is a role for all of us. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. That's for sure that this crisis is giving us a space for thinking and reflecting on our past and we definitely should use the crisis to to help us to become stronger and stronger defenders of the moral uh, values and uh, the ethical principles we use in the past which prevailed uh, 
in the facing totalitarian regimes of different kinds in our in in our history. Thank you, Jan. I'm not sure if I will be able to say goodbye to you, especially because you will probably leave during Rebecca's introductory remarks. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Uh, good luck with your personal fight for freedom of thought and religion of every person, and, and which comes from the past of your family, which we share, both of us. Thank you, Jan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Rebecca, we have heard a lot of... Uh, maybe kind of theoretical in, uh, introductions to how to frame and how to focus on religious freedoms in our policies and in our political life. Uh, you are an academic, but you are also looking into very practical issues, how religious freedom is related to social status, and especially of poor women in the global south. So maybe if you could help us to understand uh, what policies do you think can help to reverse the, era, the, the shrinking space for religious freedom in some countries? And what uh, practical examples maybe you can bring out of your, of your research that we should probably implement in our approaches and policies? We don't hear you. Can, yeah. I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you, Jan, for your very moving uh, comments. And thank you, Heino, for your theoretical framing of this very important issue. Uh, Miriam, the area I'm going to talk about is, of course, South and Southeast Asia. And before I go into my own work, I wanted very briefly to just sketch out, if I could, uh, some of the key issues or factors that are uh, contributing factors to the high levels of restrictions and to paint a picture of the high levels of restrictions in this particular area of the world, I will talk a little bit about Pew and their report, their 10th report. Um, this region, first, let me just uh, frame it for you, is is, is a rich region. It's rich in cultural and religious diversity, but it is also a region that sees some of the worst religious repression. Jan and mentioned a little bit about some of the types of religious restrictions you see in this part of the world. According to Pew's 10th annual report on religious restrictions, South and Southeast Asia is ranked higher than all other regions on the global restriction index. That is to say, this region of South and Southeast Asia is ranked higher than even the Middle East. In the most recent Pew report that came out a few days ago, and I urge you all to look at it if you haven't, it is for 2018. But it's telling because among the world's most populous 25 countries, three of the five countries that have the highest level of restrictions on religion, when you take both government restrictions and social hostilities, come from Southeast and South Asia. There are three factors. The first factor, I think, that contributes, and my own work on the intersection between religious freedom, freedom of religion or belief, and development, in some ways, is a way of trying to, as you said in some of your earlier discussions with us on the email, Miriam, to try and, try and reverse this negative trend. But let me first outline where these negative trends come from. And the first force or the first factor is this phenomenon of ethno-religious nationalism. Now, uh, we've talked about this, and I think uh, Jan mentioned it briefly. We see this in Burma, where the Mabata, an ultra-nationalist Buddhist group, uses ethnicity. And ethno-religious nationalism occurs when religion becomes entangled with aspects of group identity like ethnicity, and particularly when the majority group lay claim to a superior idea of national identity, a fact that I'm sure is not lost on you in Europe. The, in, Ma, in Burma, the Mabata use their Bama ethnicity to mobilize against the Rohingya Muslims and the Kachins, in Sri Lanka, Kachin Christians. In Sri Lanka, 
Another ultranationalist Buddhist group, the Bodhu Balasena, use Sinhalese identity to engage against Tamil Muslims and Christian communities. In all these contexts, the challenge for religious freedom is that these borderline extremist groups might at some level reflect the latent sentiments of the majority. In some ways, ethno-religious nationalism can be good. It can preserve the cultural heritage of the nation. So in some senses, I paint a negative picture, but I also want to show there are some positive aspects to, these, to, these, to this region. But the danger comes when these extremist groups utilize political, social, or extrajudicial means to force the majority's tradition, traditions, beliefs, and institutions to conform to their exclusivist and extremist views. So the first factor that drives the restrictions in the region is ethno-religious nationalism. The second factor that drives this is government restrictions. The second factor that drives restrictions on religion and freedom of religion or belief is government restrictions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Many people already know it from reading. But I would like to say that many of the countries in this South and Southeast Asia region do or did possess reasonably robust democratic institutions and robust civil societies. It is likely that the democratic nature of the institutions across the region actually made it possible for extremist and exclusivist sentiments, otherwise espoused by some sections of the population, to creep into the halls of government. Almost all the governments in this region impose far-reaching regulations on religion, religious affairs including on the religious institutions of the majority and now that's key they not only impose impose it on the minority communities but they impose it on the majority communities in other words all the governments in the region assume the government control of religion is legitimate all these countries have a baseline of very high government involvement in religion. Now, governments restrict religion not just through uh, their control of uh, uh, religious freedom, not just through their control on religion, but also through constitutional language. In Sri Lanka, we have constitutional favor favoritism for Buddhists, which allow them to restrict religion religion of other groups despite the judiciary's assertion of secularism in uh, in in Islamic Bangladesh Malaysia and Pakistan we see restriction of religious minorities despite the intention of their founders to create secular states the third force or the third factor that leads to these very very high levels of restrictions in this region, shockingly high restrictions of, of FORB in this region, is an external one. And that is the influence of Western governments and Western-supported NGOs whose activities in South and Southeast Asia are well-intentioned, but also promote ideologies of human rights, liberal freedom, and what one might call individual autonomy maximization. Now, Jan touched on this when he talked about secularism in Europe. And I'm grateful for that. In some ways, he set up this section. The human rights NGOs in the region, in the South in Southeast Asia, with Western governments backing, are motivated. They're motivated. They have the right motivations by the rising religious extremism and restrictions on vulnerable minorities. They, in turn, use these undeniably awful reality to double down on an ideological combination of secularism and liberalism that seeks to curb religious influence in the public sphere in order to make room for expansive, expansive notions of individual autonomy. Remarkably, much of the opposition, and this is key, to religious restrictions and extremism in India, for example, reflexively invoke slogans and ideologies of secularism and separationism. Now, in India, these ideas have some indigenous counterparts and traditions where there is an explicit constitutional reference to, in India as Indi to India as a secular state. However, however, and this is important, secularism per se is strongly associated with Western political ideas and models. Additionally, it carries with it 
hints of religious hostility and indifference. And it lacks a wide and deep cultural resonance in, in, that, in that it does not extend much beyond English speaking metropolitan elites. It doesn't extend beyond people like myself, for example. The and closely aligned to Western agencies and governments, that it gives human rights an image problem here in the region. Let me illustrate with a recent example. In a recent Danish Institute for Human Rights report entitled Promoting Freedom for, of Religion or Belief and Gender Equality in the Context of the Sustainable Development Goals, very important to remember this intersection, because this is something I work on, and you mentioned that, Miriam. And in that section of the report that deals with access to justice, education, and health, the authors raise an important issue, which is that in some cases, women who speak out to claim their rights might face resistance and exclusion if they defy dominant norms and values. Now, Right after describing the discrimination and later death faced by a young girl who reported an attempted rape in her school in Bangladesh, the authors do something very, I think, very problematic in that they use the Sabrimala Temple case in Kerala to illustrate their point, where in that case, women's rights activists for years advocated for a lifting of the ban on women of childbearing age from entering the temple. Now the ban in place for centuries was intended to protect the celibacy of the Hindu deity, Lord Ayapa. The activists and lawyers, I'm sure assisted in no small part, part by many Western or even Western educated uh, agencies and institutions felt that the ban was a violation of their religious freedom. In September 2018, the Supreme Court of India ruled the ban did not constitute an essential religious practice. Now, in addition to the very deeply troubling problem of the judiciary in India deciding what is essential religious practice and what isn't essential religious practice, a topic which I suggest you host a webinar on, we see, a sec we see secular statism, also a significant threat to religious freedom in the region. Although associated with human freedom, human flourishing, and pluralism, all the good things that Hina mentioned in his wonderful opening remarks, human rights too often appear to be an all or nothing cultural package that we in the region are bound to accept in every sector of society, regardless of indigenous cultural and religious traditions. This kind of human rights imperialism that is actually antithetical to religious freedom can be seen in the February 2020, 2020 report of the Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Religion or Belief, which essentially asserts that controversial rights claims related to gender and sexuality should trump the core religious freedoms acknowledged and respected in international law. What I do in my research, and I'll be very brief, is that I, I study and quantify, I do two types of research. One is a large household survey where I quantify and uh, clarify the pro-social and pro-developmental outcomes for, poor, for the poor uh, uh, of religion and in effect religious freedom. And I find have two key findings. One is that deeply held religious beliefs and practices associate, are associated with very important pro-developmental outcomes. Now these could be deeply held religious beliefs and practices of almost all religions and people who are devout or for whom religious beliefs are deeply and personally held are more likely to know an interest rate. They are more, in, and this is very important in an informal economy, they are more likely to negotiate their wages. They're more likely to own a business. The men are less likely to drink and they are less likely to use force to control their lives. In other words, religion has an on the ground impact in the lives of the poor. 
deeply held religious practices of local, local deeply held religious practices uh, uh, and beliefs of these people. The second finding we have is that individuals who enjoy the freedom to switch religious traditions, regardless of the direction, are more likely to own businesses and to experience very key important social outcomes. I won't get into that into detail, but there is a very strong statistical correlate, uh, association between these aspects of religious freedom and pro-development outcomes. In terms of inclusion, SDG number 16, peaceful and inclusive societies, we see that high levels of religious commitment and religious participation, regardless of tradition, are linked to more religiously tolerant people. That is, people who are highly, who have high religious commitment are more likely to accept someone from a different religious tradition living next door and are more open to the idea that people should have the freedom to switch religions if they will. I'll end with one sentence. We in South and Southeast Asia have the seeds of religious freedom in our own native soil. For these seeds to sprout, to thrive, we need to enable local actors. We need to take the, so that they can take the lead in protecting and promoting their own religious freedom. I do work on collecting data where local actors are owning their own religious landscape. So Miriam, very, I hope this has been okay, but what I wanted to paint a picture of was of one where there are tremendous restrictions in, and tremendous problems with respect to religious freedom in the region, but also tremendous hope. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you for this really insightful uh, contribution. And we have five minutes to, or six minutes, <laughs> six minutes to finish, so it's not a long time. But maybe br bringing the ball back to Heiner, because Rebecca has mentioned two, I think, kind of main things. First is that the more free people are to observe their religion, uh, the more support we give to the development aims of the third world, let's say, that it has a clear correlation, that the freedom of religion has a clear, clear positive impact on the social and economic well-being of, of people. And the second part that Rebecca has, which is, I think, absolutely vital, is the local actors, because, and, and maybe in contrary to the, to the the government's influence, which Rebecca described as often aiming a positive thing, but actually ha having a very harmful impact because there is a not clear uh, linkage between the understanding of those uh, third country governments of, of, their, of their impact of their policies locally. So UN as a global organization, was UN uh, and is UN able to kind of bring on board these local actors that we don't have the the kind of implementation of the policy like top down which means that the un makes a decision and and we are forcing the countries to implement it but the kind of solutions come from the grassroots local actors who are of support of religious freedom and belief okay so i'm deeply convinced that the most important actors are always the local actors. Uh, so any meaningful and sustainable change in a society must mainly rest on those people living in the community. Uh, so, and my understanding also of uh, human rights work and freedom of religion work of the United Nations is not mainly a top-down model. It's more of the other way around. Uh, so, for instance, what the UN does in a somewhat different element is protecting human rights defenders, defending defenders on the ground. But it means, I mean, recognizing, first of all, what happens on the ground. Meaningful human rights work can only be contextual work. So you have, first of all, to understand, understand, understand. And that's an ongoing process. And um, of, the, the problem, of course, is that also local actors can become under pressure, under enormous pressure. Can be, I mean, the situation can be extremely threatening. And then, of course, the international community cannot just sit on the fence 
and observe this from far apart. So there's no alternative to someone to also interfering. Because, I mean, a hands-off approach would not help. But a heavy-handed intervention, of course, can also cause a lot of damage. So I once created a formula, I mean, of, just to, to, to describe the, the, the paradox. Human rights work is somehow interfering. I mean, you cannot avoid interfering, but interference in a listening mode. So listen, 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 listen and learn and learn. And that also applies, of course, to freedom of religion or belief. I mean, you really have to appreciate the work conducted by the local actors. So, I mean, the only meaningful contribution from international organizations, but also from the EU, would be to strengthen those who do the real work on the ground. Yeah. So it's a sort of indirect support, not exporting a whole package of institutions, norms, toolboxes. I mean, that really, that would be another form of cultural imperialism. And that's certainly not needed. It's certainly not what is meant in a meaningful way when we talk about human rights work. I would like to also briefly refer to uh, Jan's presentation. Uh, I mean, he mentioned a number of different commitments of the EU in the past. Let me just single out one. The EU guidelines, the 2013 EU guidelines on religious freedom. Whenever I conducted fact-finding missions in various parts of the world, including in the part where Rebecca lives. I was in some of these countries myself, myself, always trying to listen and learn and understand, but also experience, experience in a climate of intimidation. So when difficult, okay, whenever I had these missions, I also met with EU representatives, sometimes in an, in an embassy in the capital. The keys to human freedom, democracy, rule of law, and economic and social well-being. So thank you so much for your contributions. Thank, I, I, I apologize for the technical uh, challenges we had, but uh, we have to overcome those as we have to work only online. Uh, I wish you all uh, good health, and I'm looking forward to our further cooperation and, and thank you for your support in, in the fight for religious freedoms worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.